Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Hazabajan YouTube channel. It is Harry here and today I thought I would start a new type of series again. I mean all of these things are going to be new types of series at the moment to be honest. But I just thought I'd start a new series of giving original lists of 10 or 5 or 7 or however many numbers of things it may be. So I thought I'd start this series with one of the most integral components of football and that is transfers. Transfers have been part and parcel and an integral fabric of football ever since the 1890s, when the player retention scheme was created by the FA. The fees have been rising exponentially with inflation, until recently that is, and now we have valuations of players in excess of £200 million, a far cry from the transfers of years gone by, even with inflation taken into account. However, for this video I'm not going to be focusing on the most expensive deals or the bargain deals or anything like that. But I'm going to focus instead on 10, which I believe changed the football landscape forever, be it through the impact on a club or the impact on the sport as a whole. This isn't ordered or ranked or anything like that. It's just 10 arbitrary transfers, which I think played a key part in changing football forever. But I feel as though their influence on the game cannot be understated. So without further ado, here are my 10 influential football transfers. Number one, Ronaldinho from PSG to Barcelona. Ronaldinho, simply put, was a joy to watch. A Samba star who played the game how he wants to play it and with a massive smile on his face at all times. His tricks, flicks and skills wowed audiences for years. However, his transfer to the new camp was game changing in as much as it was political as it was marketing. Maybe this was the transfer that rubber stamped football as a marketing as much as a sporting game. Juan Laporta the Barcelona president at the time, had made it his campaign promise to sign David Beckham, the Manchester United superstar, even though United had already agreed a deal for him to go to Real Madrid. Laporta used this as a cover-up to win the election, which he did, but when Beckham inevitably went to Madrid, Laporta instead signed Ronaldinho for around $30 million. Furthermore, this frustrated United, who hoped to sign him as a replacement for Beckham, so they instead turned their attentions to an 18-year-old winger from Portugal who had been touted for greatness. That turned out quite well. Another twist followed as apparently Real Madrid had actually turned down the Brazilian magician as he wasn't marketable enough as a result of his supposedly ugly appearance, hence why they signed Golden Balls, aka David Beckham. Sadly for them, Ronaldinho went on to become one of the most indisputably marketable players in the world, with sponsorships for Nike, Coca-Cola and EA following. Furthermore, the team who won the La Liga title and the Champions League in the three seasons following the two transfers wasn't Madrid, but the Blaugrana spearheaded by Ronaldinho and his myriad of goals, assists and showboating. He even received a standing ovation by the Madrid fans at the Bernabeu after a superb El Clasico performance in November 2005. Not bad for an ugly man. Number 2. Neymar from Barcelona to PSG in 2017. Okay, so I know that I said at the start that I wasn't focusing on the world's most expensive transfers, but this one is too significant to ignore, purely on the basis of its impact on the world's transfer fees certainly up until the economic crisis caused by the pandemic which is engulfing our world, the name of which I cannot mention as a result of potential demonetization issues. We were all aware of the transfer scandal. It was one of those will he, won't he moments scattered around football's history. As one minute he looked like he was going, then Gerard Piquet, Barcelona's defensive king, posted a picture with Neymar saying he stays. Of course he did not, and this transfer obliterated the previous transfer record by more than double what it previously was, as PSG triggered his eye-watering release clause of £200 million, which was originally put in place to deter any potential suitor from buying it. So much for that working. Ever since then, player valuations have shot through the roof, where we have seen at least six more £100 million plus transfers occurring in the last three years, with only one of them really being a success up to this point, and three made by Barcelona, none of them being successful. Ten years ago, £80 million pounds could get you Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, it gets you Harry Maguire. Bournemouth were valuing Callum Wilson at £75 million pounds, and Joe Linton somehow classed himself as a £40 million pound player. All thanks to one transfer, the whole world footballing market was turned upside down. Number 3. Willie Groves from Middlesbrough to Aston Villa, 1893. Now, I tried to look up the first paid transfer, but I couldn't find such an instance. What I did find, however, was the first £100 plus transfer fee paid for a player. And that man who was the subject of that bid was Willie Groves. He transferred from Middlesbrough to Aston Villa in 1893 and helped Villa win the league that season. But sadly, he later suffered from ill health and died aged just 39 in 1908 as a result of tuberculosis. However, this payment was a significant step in the moves away from amateurism and towards professionalism, which, 
only a decade earlier, had been severely rebuked as a viable form of practice by the authority. In 1885, the FA had introduced a player registration scheme, enforcing a player to register with a certain club. Beforehand, it was a free-for-all, with players able to change clubs as they so pleased. But in 1893, this was changed so that once a player had registered with a club, he couldn't change without gratification from the FA and the two clubs. As such, clubs began to seek fees for their players to be leased to other clubs, and Willie Groves was the first to break the £100 barrier. Little did anyone know at this point just how out of control transfers would end up being. Number 4. Alex Teixeira from Shakhtar Donetsk to Jiangsu Suning in 2016. This might be Christ the Road 1, but in the modern era, I'd say that this holds a lot of leverage when it comes to important transfers. Alex Teixeira shot to prominence at Shakhtar Donetsk as he scored 48 goals in 63 games in the course of one and a half seasons between the summer of 2014 and January 2016 in all competitions. Plenty of big clubs wanted his signature, most notably of which was Liverpool, even putting in a bid for him which was rejected by Shakhtar. However, this transfer is significant in my eyes because it showed, in all its inglory, the rest of the world the monetary clout that the Chinese Super League had. Yes, at that time there were many star names who were clogging up the division, such as Hulk, Freddy Guarin, Paulinho and Ezekiel Lavetsi, but there were mostly players who hadn't quite made the cut in European football and or were seeking a last massive paycheck. Tejera, however, was in his prime and could very feasibly have been snapped up by many of the elites who was chasing his signature, but instead he chose the riches of China, moving to Jiangsu Suning for 50 million euros. This led to a raft of players taking similar passages to Tejera, including compatriots Oscar and Anderson Talisca and Yannick Ferrara Carrasco, who has since gone back to Atletico Madrid. Money does talk sometimes. Number 5. Rude Hurlitz from Sampdoria to Chelsea, 1995. This was perhaps the transfer that signalled the arrival of the power of the Premier League in the world game and change its culture and landscape forever. Whilst I hate to refer to it as simply the Premier League because football wasn't created in 1992, despite what some people will have you believe, this transfer was the one that put England on the map as a viable destination for high profile footballers the world over. The revamp was needed, admittedly, as English football was suffering from hooliganism, stadium tragedies and racism, amongst other issues, leading to a lack of mass appeal across the world. Rude Hullet's arrival at Chelsea on a free in 1995 albeit certainly a rude hurt that passed the peak of his powers, showcased the Premier League's newfound pulling power and engendered an influx of foreign players and managers onto British shores. Within a year, Dennis Bergkamp, Gianfranco Zola and David Ginola would all arrive in England and managers such as Arsene Wenger, Gerard Houllier and Ruud Hullet himself would be appointed by Premier League clubs over the next few years. From 13 foreign players in the first Premier League season in 1992-93 to 51% of players hailing from outside of Britain according to transfer marks, and nine clubs under the helm of foreign managers from none in 1995, it is clear that Hullet's transfer heralded the change in focus of Premier League clubs and, perhaps indirectly, was a factor in the astounding increases of money within the sport. Number 6. Edgar Davids from Ajax to AC Milan, 1995. Okay, so I'll hold my hands up, there is a caveat to this one. This is basically an excuse for me to put in the case of Jean-Marc Bosman, whose transfer to Dunkirk didn't actually materialise. However, its repercussions were so wide-ranging that I couldn't leave it out of my list. Jean-Marc Bosman was an otherwise unfashionable Belgian footballer who wanted to leave Liège for Dunkirk. But Dunkirk refused to pay the fee that Liège were demanding despite Bosman being out of contract. Bosman stamped his feet demanding a move, but Liège cut his wages by 75% and forced him to stay at the club, meaning that Bosman was trapped. He took his case to court, appealing that all EU citizens had a right to freedom of movement, including footballers, especially once their contract with the club was up. This now meant clubs could sign players on pre-contract agreements across the world without having to pay a single fee to the selling club. Edgar Davids, moving from Ajax to Milan, was the first player to make the move under this new system, meaning that his transfer holds significance in the grand context of the footballing landscape, even after he left Milan for after just a year to join Juventus, as he was the first Bosman transfer, as it was now widely known, to take place in the world of football. Players that have moved as a result of this include Sol Campbell from Spurs to Arsenal, Robert Lewandowski from Dortmund to Bayern, and Luis Enrique from Real Madrid to Barcelona. Sally for Bosman, he played his last professional game in 1995 and he spiralled down into a world of bankruptcy, alcoholism, legal fees brought on by his multiple court cases that he simply couldn't pay, depression and unemployment. So much for changing the world. Number 7. Neil Franklin from Stoke City to Independiente Santa Fe, 1950. A player almost none of you will have heard of, yet a player who would fit right at the home in any side of the modern era. Neil Franklin was an English ball playing centre back who didn't often resort to the lump it up the pitch and hope approach of many of his contemporaries, and Tony Pulis. He was England's first choice centre back and their key man by 1950, 
but after many board disputes, he implored to leave Stoke, his club, but couldn't transfer to another club as Stoke refused to terminate his registration with them. However, he was lured away by the riches of Colombia, promised a lucrative contract and lifestyle, and, as they weren't members of FIFA, he could transfer to them without worry of registration laws. He did so in 1950, a matter of weeks before England's first ever World Cup campaign. Not all was what it seemed though, and Franklin struggled to adapt to life in Santa Fe, with most of the promises he had been given turning out to be false, We're living in a city with continued drug cartel violence, for example. He eventually left with his pregnant wife back to England, but unfortunately the country turned his back on him and he never won another cap, sliding down the leagues as a lack of trust from those around him descended down. This transfer in my opinion is highly significant, as not only did it inspire a whole host of other English players to join him, who also returned very quickly with similar consequences, but England struggled to find his replacement until Bobby Moore came along, setting them back more than 15 years than they already were despite their aloofness in thinking their style of play and their attitude to the game was better than everyone else's, as Hungary proved in 1953 quite emphatically after winning 7-3 at Wembley, it wasn't. Number 8. Johan Cruyff from Ajax to Barcelona, 1973. On the playing side of things, this transfer is still very significant, but not quite as significant as you might think. Yes, it broke a world record, and yes, Cruyff did lead Barcelona to a La Liga title in his first season, but he only won a Copa del Rey alongside that original triumph, and whilst he did help to fully instigate total football at the club alongside his manager and compatriot Rinas Michels, it wasn't his playing which had the greatest impact. Instead, it was as a result of his allegiance to Barcelona, meaning that he would later return as a manager, and that was where things truly kicked off. Cruyff transformed the entire landscape of Barcelona, renovating La Masia, Barcelona's youth academy and placing much more emphasis on those who came through the system. Indeed, Cruyff spotted a young man playing on the wing during a Barcelona B game and asked why he was playing there when he thought that he was better suited to playing in holding midfield. That man was Pep Guardiola, a man who became the linchpin in Barcelona's dream team of the late 80s and early 90s, helping them to win the club's first European Cup in 1992 under Cruyff's management. Not only that, but Cruyff introduced the tiki-taka style with which Barcelona are now synonymous. Promoting players from within and playing a passing game? Sounds familiar. Because Pep Guardiola did the exact same thing when he became Barcelona manager. Although as a Cruyff acolyte, he has stated that Cruyff made the Barcelona chapel and other managers just redecorate it. A significant transfer, albeit maybe not how they anticipated it. Number nine, Giuseppe Savoldi from Bologna to Napoli, 1975. Quite simply put, he was the first one million pound footballer merely 14 years on from another Italian club, Torino, breaking the £100,000 barrier to sign Dennis Law from Manchester City. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking, but Harry, Trevor Francis was the first £1 million footballer, wasn't he? Well, you're partially right. He was the first of this ilk in England when he transferred to Nottingham Forest in 1979, but this took place four years after the transfer which I'm focusing on. Giuseppe Savoldi, a striker known for his pace, aerial ability and penalty taking exploits, was a prolific striker at Bologna and he was signed by Napoli in 1975 for 2 billion lira, which translates to 1.2 million pounds at the time, where he continued his exploits, scoring a decent record of 55 goals in 118 games. However, why I think this transfer was extremely impactful in the world of football is that it broke an extremely significant milestone in football. No longer were we talking about thousands of pounds as records, but now we are into the stratospheric million mark, something which has yet to be breached. Number 10, Alfredo Di Stefano from Millonarios to Real Madrid, 1953. Even though I'm not ordering this list, this is undoubtedly the most influential football transfer of all time. Not just because it wasn't meant to football as a whole, but of how inextricably linked to politics it also was. Di Stefano, who was another player tempted by the riches of Colombian league like Franklin was, was courted by Real Madrid and Barcelona, but especially the latter, who actually agreed a deal to sign him which was ratified by FIFA. When discussing this transfer, though, you have to put it in the political context of the time. Spain were ruled by the dictator Franco, a fervent nationalist who banned regionalized parts of Spain from displaying their separate flags, and who recognized that Real Madrid's success was more paramount than Barcelona's success. Franco, who may have had a say in this particular transfer of Di Stefano, had an undeniable apathy towards Catalonian causes, and as Barcelona were, and still are, the pivotal voice from a sporting perspective of Catalonian succession, they weren't in the general's good books. Sadly for Barcelona, potentially as a result of the influence from Franco, the Spanish FA blocked the move, especially since Real Madrid were in for him too. FIFA gave in and ruled that Di Stefano must spend one season at Les Cortes, Barcelona's stadium before the new Camp, and then the next at the Bernabeu, and so on and so forth. 
Barcelona's president, outraged and humiliated by this, resigned and the board cancelled their side of the contract. Di Stefano went on to become the most pivotal player in Real Madrid's history, helping them to win the first five European Cups in the competition's inception and eight La Liga titles, scoring 308 goals in 396 appearances as a midfielder. Barcelona, meanwhile, won just two La Liga titles during Di Stefano's stay at Real Madrid and didn't win the European Cup until 1992. As such, I can't really deny that this is the most influential transfer that the game has ever known. That just about wraps up this video. Thank you very, very much for watching. If you have any other thoughts or transfers I may have missed out, do let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching again, and until next time, see you then.